agriculture is one of the most important assets to be used to restore and to revive our economy while producing meaning. This African saying summarizes perfectly the conversation we are about to have. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dode Huenga from the Africa unit of the World Heritage Center. Since 2018, I have actively been working for the safeguarding of African World Heritage Site in Africa as driver for the sustainable development across the continent. When one considers the dynamics of the African Renaissance, one sees that the levers for its achievements are multiple and based on several pillars. Firstly, the idea of cultural unity with an appropriation of our heritage and history. Secondly, an economic unity with a real exploitation on a sustainable manner of our natural and cultural diversity. And thirdly, a political unity from which must emerge a true democracy, the defense of human rights and a fight against corruption. However, the Pan-African Renaissance initiative cannot be accomplished or fully accomplished without the strong belief that each African must recover a correct self-image with the required self-esteem and a confidence to rehabilitate and unleash the human, social, and cultural capital of the continent. This awareness is fundamental to better understand and tap into the unique potential of our heritage across the continent. Launched in 2018, the African Dialogue Series is the UN Office of the Special Advisor on Africa flagship events. It occurs annually and focuses on current and emerging African issues in line with the team chosen by the African Union. This year, in 2021, the African Union has chosen the team Arts, Culture and Heritage, Levers for Building the Africa We Want. This team focuses on consolidating and sustaining African cultural and artistic heritage as a unifying force for the continent. Unfortunately, emergency Pension has a strong social impact on the continent and more particularly on our culture. In parallel to this health crisis, electoral troubles, insecurity, terrorism, armed conflict, and ongoing social economic problems are additional factors to the long list of obstacles to the unleashing of culture as a force for development. Today's topic, human capital, culture and heritage, unleashing the potential is complex and cannot only be approached from different perspectives, history, anthropology, sociology, and economy. To help me in this incredible task, I'm accompanied by four outstanding African panelist experts on African cultural including Professor Shedrick Shirekure. He is a national of Zimbabwe and graduated with degrees of Master of Art in Artifact Studies and PhD in Archaeology from the University College London. He is professor in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town, where he directs two research facilities the African Heritage Herb and Research Center, and the Archaeology Materials Laboratory. In addition, he is a British Academy Global Professor in the School of Archaeology at Oxford. He is also Honorary Research Associate in Cambridge. Chiku's undergraduate and postgraduate training covered African history, anthropology, 
management and political economy. Welcome, Professor. My first question for you, Professor, is Africa has an immense human capital and diverse cultures that could naturally contribute to its growth and sustainable development. However, the continent has been struggling to unlock this unique potential. Based on your background, your experience, what could you see as mean historical root causes? Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for having me. So two things. The first one is colonialism. And the second one is um, the legacies of colonialism um, in a post-independent Africa. Colonialism was a system which was designed to exploit Africa. It was designed to knock the confidence of Africans. So Africa was considered backward, lacking in uh, innovation, and not necessar necessarily um, the education system, which was designed during colonialism, was aimed at extracting resources from Africa, not at job creation and not at empowering at the, at the Africans. That's why um, some of uh, a few of the Africans were trained as geologists. Uh, a few others were trained as clerks, and um, the economy was built around places like, you know, Lagos, uh, Johannesburg, um, Nairobi, so that um, the raw materials and everything can be can be ship, shipped uh, to uh, to Europe or America. When Africa then got um, independence, it inherited that kind of uh, uh, system which was uh, never meant to benefit um, Africa and uh, Africans. The education system um, was also designed to support uh, the colonial project and was never amended. So as a result, we have an education system um, where we lack skills. So we have uh, amazing heritage, both natural and, um, and cultural. But at the end of the day, we cannot run successful startups based on that heritage. You can be trained in the arts, and then you don't know how balance sheets work. You don't know how finances work. It means that you cannot create opportunities out of the culture and out of the, out of the heritage. So that is the, uh, the, main, uh, the, the main reason why, as Africans, we cannot uh, fully exploit um, the benefits of our cultural inheritance, um, the benefits of uh, our natural of our natural heritage. Um, the current system does not serve um, Africa well, and the post-colony must amend uh, these um, colonial ways to ensure that uh, these historical legacies uh, do not constrain uh, the potential which the continent and its people have. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the, this deep uh, analysis. But in this context, can you tell us more about the role of education in changing this historic negative mindset about African cultures as a lever for uh, sustainable development? So the the first thing that we need to do is to have um, a mindset shift, right? The uh, we have been doing the same thing over and over again with the same result that Africa is being eluded by prosperity. Ghana, the very first African country, you know, to gain independence, right? Why has uh, prosperity eluded Ghana? Why has pr prosperity eluded Nigeria and, 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 the other, and the other African countries? And um, it's not a question of Africans being incapable. We have seen that Africans have excelled in all fields. And our top CEOs, top government ministers, and so on. This is about uh, the system and a system which has not worked. So we need to come up with a new education system that prioritizes um, solutions, providing solutions, right? Not talk shows. Holistic education that is integrated, that combines culture, business science, computing, entrepreneurship, so that we can deliver 
solutions to all these uh, problems that are affecting um, the, the, the continent. So rather than seeing problems in Africa, we should be seeing opportunities um, all over. That's what we are trying to do with the Heritage Hub at the University of Cape Town. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I have now the honor to welcome our second incredible uh, panelist, uh, Professor Ola Oduku. She is uh, a British African architect who took up a chair in architecture at the Manchester School of Architecture in 2017. Priya to this, she was reader in architecture and the Dean International for Africa at Edinburgh University. She is also a member of the Nigerian Institute of Architects and the Royal Institute of British Architects. Her research are in modern architecture in West Africa, the history of educational architecture and the contemporary issues related to social infrastructure provision for minority communities in city in the west and south she has also an interest in environmental design and supporting equality in academia welcome professor thank you very much let, let me start with uh, a quote from you professor saying that sharing of information and display of African intangible heritage has a significant impact on the narrative around culture and development in Africa. End of your quote. For you, Professor, what is the main impact of the traditional ways of promoting and sharing information around Africa heritage in today's reality? Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I brought, I said that as a provocation in many ways, but what I would say is that um, we all understand our heritage and a lot of us were taught our first histories as we sat down and listened to our grandparents talking to us. The idea of the griot, the um, intelligent person in the village who talks to you is something that we have really begun to forget about, really in keeping with what Shadrach has just said. These traditional modes of learning are the ways in which we have an original relationship to our history. And what we find now, particularly when we look at the built environment, you can build a thousand and one museums, but in reality, what we need is that link where we're able to relate our oral history to our understanding of culture. And that narrative is something that we need to be able to um, tell our, our children, our students, and so on and so forth. So for me, whenever I'm doing work in Africa, I often go to schools and certainly I go to universities and speak with undergraduates, but I also engage those who have the histories of the places that I'm talking about. So for example, in Ghana, in Jamestown, but it is a very historic neighborhood which was set up in the Victorian times by the British. But there are people who remember their parents and they can remember what that neighborhood was like back in the 1940s, uh, 1950s, before Ghanaian independence. Now, I could again send the students to go and read a lot of books in libraries, but I can also, and what I try and do is to link students with those who have this history, the knowledge of the history. So in the case of Ghana, there are a lot of former mayors of the city who we have had engagements with and they talk to the students and the students link with them. And oftentimes with the use of images as well, we have that link between the present and the past. And this linkage is what I would say creates the narrative and relates the younger people to the reality of today. To me, this is much more effective than sometimes building new museums. We really need to have that link between those who hold the history, as has always been the case in most of Africa anyway, and the places that we're talking about in terms of history. Thank you very much, Professor. But what could also be the role of the African diaspora and the civil society organization to promote our uh, heritage in, in order to unlock potential for the continent? Uh, same thing. Um, this time, let me take you to Brazil. Brazil has an amazing culture, but the diaspora there has begun to make those links now to Nigeria. 
the um the well indeed in intangible culture like capoeira which we all know which is actually one of um, um brazil's um cultural heritages has that link with nigeria and what we do have is this diaspora link between the capoeiristas in bahia coming to talk to people in lagos who also have a, a neighborhood that is aguda that is known to have these brazilian links but also, if I go back to Ghana, the, uh, well, indeed, the UNESCO supported Roots to Roots project means that we have black Americans who link their history, which is the sad history definitely of the slave trade, but they have these diaspora connections. At academic levels, this means we have institutes of diaspora and African studies in places like the University of Lagos. And also in all fairness, across the water again, in places like Florida and lots of um, parts of the East Coast of America, there are institutes that work directly with their colleagues in Africa. But we need to develop these collaborations yet more again. But certainly we are able to have these um, connections. The Dubois Institute, for example, uh, as some of you will know, W.E.B. Dubois, one of the major Pan-Africanists, he actually moved from America to Ghana. So we are now working with the University of Ghana and um, some of the academics in America to resuscitate the Institute. It was started off in the 60s. So this will also be a center for black American research on areas that we're still dealing with today in terms of um, racism and so on. But that link between um, Du Bois, who had that diaspora linkage with both the Americas and also uh, Ghana and the Pan-African diaspora is, is being made. And we're able to use the buildings and make these connections both academically and socially. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, allow me now to introduce our next outstanding speaker, Mrs. Uh, Emily Drani. She holds a Master of Philosophy in Development Studies. She's a co-founder and former executive director of the Cross-Cultural Foundation of Uganda, an organization dedicated to promoting the value of cultural in development approach. Emily has over 16 years professional experience in development work, of which the last 14 focus on cultural rights, heritage development, and promotion at all levels. As the vice chairperson of the executive committee of the International National Trust Organization and the UNESCO Evaluation Body for the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, Emily has been actively promoting the safeguarding of, of our heritage for the current and future future generations. Welcome, Mrs. Emily uh, Dran. My, my thank first you very question. Much. Thank you, and uh, pleasure to have you. My first question for you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Emily: How can African Union and African governments capitalize on communities and traditional knowledge system? for peace, social inclusion, and economic growth. Um, thank you very much for this invite. I, the first question you'd ask is, how much do African and the AU actually recognize Africa's cultural heritage? It's important that you recognize something and um, utilize it to be able to appreciate its potential. So the first thing governments should do is to recognize and invest in cultural heritage, noting diverse and noting that our heritage uh, transverses colonial boundaries. So you find heritage in Kenya in different parts of Africa because the communities have moved but they share the same heritage. And that's a very important element of restoring traditions that are dying and to make sure that social cohesion can be established across borders. Um, it's also important to recognize the role of traditional leadership and governance in creating security, conflict resolution, as well as co peaceful existence. Um, our human capital has not been developed very much because there's very limited um, efforts to utilize Africa's heritage 
for creative and um, cultural industries. So many times you'll find artists will imitate and borrow from outside Africa, and yet Africa is so rich and full of color and full of diversity that can be a potential product. Secondly, African governments need to deal with the legacy of colonialism and decolonizing the mind. We've already heard about this, and in many African countries, our own government, post-colonial governments have perpetuated laws and policies that have actually made Africans disassociate themselves from their own heritage. And that is something that is a responsibility of our leadership. Um, a number of communities would be surprised if you're suddenly interested in their heritage, because for a long time, cultural heritage was not seen as something useful. It was irrelevant. It's not part of development. It's not part of politics. And um, therefore, it has not been developed sufficiently to address contemporary development challenges. So our government, our communities need to start recognizing that our, our own culture has a contribution to the challenges we face today. And especially for the youth, many of the youth have not seen the usefulness of culture because they've been born in a generation, in a world where African culture is seen as irrelevant. So where do they get the confidence to use um, cultural heritage, whether it's for art, whether it's for employment, cultural tourism is very low in Africa, and yet Africa is full of rich diversity and, and rich culture. In Uganda, as an example, religion has played a very important role in demonizing culture. We find that in uh, a number of communities, cultural leadership have changed religions and uh, their religious beliefs, and they have disassociated themselves from their traditions. And as a result, we are losing valuable cultural knowledge, cultural heritage, and cultural values. Finally, what um, the AU and African countries recognize cultural rights as a, a major component of human rights. It is a human right to be able to access, enjoy, express your heritage. But they should also be cognizant of historical marginalization and oppression um, amongst minority and uh, majority ethnic groups. It could be based on gender, social status, initiation, age. There are different forms um, through which cultural rights are expressed. And it can either be uh, for the positive or negative. Managing diversity is, is an important element and uh, recognizing that culture in Africa is so diverse. It's an important skill that all governments need to be able to engage with. And ideally, it's the responsibility of our governments to make sure that SDGs and the Agenda 2063 connects with our heritage and not another bottom-down blueprint of development. Rather, what does our heritage say that feeds into the SDGs, into the agenda, and therefore makes sense? So creating that synergy and being able to um, make sense of development goals, global development goals, based on an interrogation of our worldviews, cultural logic, and the philosophies of Africa, including Ubuntu. Thank you. Yeah, but you talk also about uh, uh, youth, and my, my question uh, for you is considering the workforce of uh, Africa, of our continent, what type of skills uh, and opportunities are needed for African youth to create this Africa uh, we want using, uh, of course, culture and uh, our heritage? Again, I would respond to that question with another question to the extent to which we connect with the youth today. You know, do the youth know about the heritage? Do they even know what the Africa we want is? and what role they expected to play as authors and future custodians of our heritage. So some of the skills they definitely need to have is, um, for instance, critical reasoning and thinking, so that they're able to understand heritage, assess it, and be the ones to determine what heritage is discussed. Maybe a technical problem from uh, our our panelists, uh, Mrs. Uh, Born in a very diverse context, the youth. Yeah, Mrs. Emily, 
could you just go back like 10 seconds before because we, okay. we lost your duty? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the youth need to. I think it's uh, the same technical issue. I, I will now uh, maybe uh, welcome our last but not the least speaker. She's a mentor and an inspiration, at least to me. Dr. Isha Losen Odia, a national of Nigeria, is a senior social development specialist in the social sustainability and inclusion global practices of the World Bank. Wow. Prior to joining the bank in 2019, she was a consultant to various international organizations, including UNESCO, African Development Bank, and the World Bank, working in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as Middle East and North African regions. A twin architect with cumulative experience as architect, university teacher, and cultural heritage specialist. Welcome to this conversation, Dr. Ishan. As African countries struggle to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, save lives and rebuild their economies, what role can culture and heritage play in recovery effort of the African countries? Thank you very much, Dode, and thank you for having me at this very important uh, uh, discussion. Um, we all know that um, COVID-19 has, um, has um, dealt a very huge setback to the achievements of the past few years, either from the MDG era or to the SDG era. All the worldwide efforts to end um, extreme poverty and reduce inequality, we're, we are seeing up to 150 million people that are going to be back in extreme poverty um, over the past one year. Now. During this period also, we have seen the cultural sector, not just in Africa, but across the world suffer. And we have seen communal living, social gatherings, and um, every, all the activities that enhance relationships have been affected by this. And um, I mean, many religious and cultural festivals have been um, canceled. And so as we, as we look forward to recovery, because I'm not, yet, but as we look forward beyond uh, this um, current period that we're in, um, let us look at what we have already achieved in terms of economic and human development in Africa, vis-a-vis -vis the cultural arts and heritage of Africa. Um, I'll give an example with Nollywood. In 2016, Nollywood contributed 2.3% to the, to the GDP of Nigeria. And that is just in Nigeria. Across the continent, we have a growing cinema um, industry. So if we are able to calculate that, we are going to come to up with a, a very large um, a percentage um, contribution to GDP. In Nollywood alone contributes over a million jobs annually to the Nigerian economy. That is a potential that can go forward. We are also seeing that during the COVID era, for instance, um, the communication, the tech communications provided opportunities for expression for many people across Africa, particularly the use of culture. Culture was a, a, a great um, motivator in passing across the message regarding the control of the, um, of the virus, whether it was, it was using traditional theater, whether it was using languages, whether it was using cultural expressions that people could relate to. It is important for us to invest in, um, in, in culture in Africa, because there are several things that, that, that it's, it, it holds in itself, and I think um, my fellow panelists have alluded to this, it holds in itself um, the very essence of how we can find the solutions to the development um, dilemma that we find ourselves in. We are caught in so many cycles of whether, it, it depends on what, um, the, the issues at the global level are we're caught up in so many cycles that we have not come to define in Africa our own worldview that is based on our own culture. It is the moment that Africa determines what its worldview is 
either as individual nation states or as, as, uh, as, as a continent, that we can determine what our, the place of Africa would be going forward. And it is only when we determine that worldview, that, um, that vision for ourselves on the continent, that we can, deter that we can also uh, develop policies that are centered around cultural practices, our own arts, because the, the arts are creative in nature. We can create, I mean, with, um, Professor um, Dukut alluded to architecture and the creation, um, the creation of, the, of, of built space. Um, when we are centered and focused on what is the essence of being African and what is the essence of African creativity and production, that will guide the recovery process. Uh, the solutions will not come from outside. We have, for too long, Africa has depended on using solutions that have come from other contexts for other problems to try and solve itself, uh, its own problems. And so it is important that that inward look and drawing from within is going to be critical to moving forward because it will help us to address issues of persistent exclusion. Emily made mention earlier on to inclusion, uh, to the need for us to include people who are marginalized. Rising inequalities in our economies, in our countries, across our continent is an issue. How can we look uh, into how to address inequalities in our own communities? And then there, we also have to deal with conflict. This morning, we had the news of the death of another African leader in a conflict situation. How can we draw upon traditional and cultural notions of peacekeeping and peacemaking, peacemaking um, to, to breach um, the gaps and to also address conflict and address the fragility that many of our countries increasingly find themselves in. Uh, despite the uh, decades of, in, of investment in development, um, what, how can we address the fact that we still have a lot of vulnerable, marginalized groups? How can we use culture as a lever to pull in those marginalized groups? There are aspects of culture that are positive, that, are, that can be used to develop socially. And there are also aspects that are negative, but the narrative is often about the negative aspects of African culture. And I think we need to change that narrative and say, there are things that can be done. Leadership is done in certain communities, in certain ways, what can we draw? Are we, uh, what can we draw upon from those cultural practices in leadership? Are we, doing, are we importing leadership models that are correct, that are right for us? Why hasn't it worked 60 years after independence? until we get the leadership aspects right. And until we're able to draw upon what the culture, the sociocultural models are, the dreams for um, inclusion and sustainability will remain dreams. We cannot uh, realize them. We really need to, um, to, pull, to look um, inward and, and draw upon um, our internal resources to address these very heavy challenges that we face today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Ishan, and allow us uh, to use this channel to pay tribute uh, to uh, the President Idris uh, Devi uh, Itno. And you talk about uh, leadership, and as you know, opinions vary from countries to countries and from expert to expert. To what extent does the restitution of cultural properties to Africa represent an opportunity for the continent human capital. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dodi. Um, culture matters for sustainable development. There is no, um, there is no civilization that has developed without focusing on its own culture or using its own culture as as the, as the pedestal from which it, it flew up. The Sarah Sar Savoy report of 2018 about um, the, uh, the restitution of cultural property to Africa in, uh, informs us that this restituting 
cultural property could contribute to building social cohesion because those the the elements of cultural property that are returned to the communities to the societies from which they were taken can also form a um, a point of coalescing members of those communities around i take the example of the benin bronzes for instance those over 500 pieces that went away tell the story of a kingdom of a city state that is over 500 years old and that has had that had been in, um um involved in international trade way before the transatlantic um, slave trade began and everything. Um, so the, the, the restoration of cultural property will help to uh, restore collective pride in the creative genius of ancestors. I think um, Shadrach Professor Chirikuri uh, alluded earlier to the fact that there is something about the, uh, the education system from the colonial period that makes it that Africans do not even have pride in what or who they are. Just the fact that we're able to see some of this cultural property. And because I know personally that seeing some of these things makes me proud of the, the creative genius. Oh, I, I come from a group of people that actually were able to you know, do these things, even outside of, um, of external influences. It will also restore the agency of Africans to their own history and help us to come to terms with our past, whether it be the pre-colonial or the, the colonial gap, because I think, I think the colonial period was a gap in the progression of African um, history. And this will further create, um, contribute to um, the, the, the growing decolonization discourse, whether it is in terms of how we develop, how we approach the, our development um, process, or how we educate children, or how we also fraternize and socialize amongst ourselves and within our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ishan. Maybe uh, Mrs. Emily, we lost you due to technical uh, challenges. Uh, do you want to uh, pick up the question regarding opportunities and skills for African youth? Yes, please. Yeah, please. So, uh, the the question that I had is, do the youth actually know what the Africa we want is? And do they see themselves as players? So the youth need to be groomed into appreciating heritage and they need to be groomed into realizing they're our future custodians. Some of the skills they need are critical reasoning or critical thinking to be able to assess what is um, valuable about heritage and not listen too much from outside perspectives to understand why did our communities do what they did and value them. Managing diversity is a given because we are such a diverse continent. We have to learn how to manage difference, manage difference with respect. And also drawing on our natural cultural heritage. The youth need to realize there is so much heritage, there's such wealth within Africa. They don't need to go anywhere else to innovate and be creative and have a product that is uniquely African. The opportunities they have are, are vast because they have, we have so many traditional practices, occasions, festivals through which culture is transmitted to the younger generation. We have community meetings, clan meetings, governance systems that the, the young people can observe through non-formal education to appreciate um, our heritage and uh, learn about it. The issue of craftsmanship through entrepreneurship and uh, apprenticeship, the youth can also learn about the skills. We talked about architecture, we've talked about pottery. There's so many things that were proudly African that we don't have now. So how do we restore those skills? And it's through going back and um, respecting the, the role of traditional um, resource persons. In the whole continent, I think all African countries must have a degree course on heritage studies because what we are studying now has been the views of others who have observed and have documented African heritage from their perspective. We need our own students, our own professionals to be able to study our heritage and explain it in the way that it's, it has meaning. And therefore, that is a space. In some of the countries, we have uh, education curricula that has picked up on cultural heritage, but that's not across the board. And I think that's something that um, should really be taken up by African countries. Thank you. 
Thank you very much uh, all for your outstanding contribution during this uh, first round of question. You have uh, clearly demonstrated that uh, African culture and heritage uh, matter. All of you, you have uh, highlighted the crucial role culture and heritage can play as a catalyst for human capital in order to contribute to the social economic development and the integration of the Africa uh, continent. You also point out that despite the diversity, the continent's human capital is hardly harnessed and has difficulty being fully considered in our development strategy. You have, of course, provided solutions to unleash the human capital of Africa using culture and heritage for instance, by renewing our educational system at all implementation level, by strengthening the link between cultural heritage and sustainable development, by reinforcing the role of new actors like the diaspora and African civil society organization, so on and so forth. Once again, thank you very much for your amazing contribution. Now I would like to ask two questions to all of you. Knowing that Africa is a cradle of humanity and more than 50% of human capital and some of the AU instruments and UNESCO cultural convention uh, to, uh, are in place to help state parties to effectively achieve the sustainable development goal, I would like to know, maybe uh, Professor Ola uh, could start, what could be the role of EU instrument and UNESCO convention to effectively achieve the sustainable development goals? Right, well, thank you. Thank you for putting me on the spot. Um, I think definitely mm -hmm. the sustainable development goals and the way in which the EU works with it is absolutely critical. Uh, some of my colleagues have already said that Africa is both a continent and a collection, I would say, of uh, local groups, because I think the word tribes, again, is very colonial. Now, this means that when we look at these goals, we can look at it across the continent. We should have an Africa viewpoint on how we do things, how we understand our identity and our understanding of how this sustainability is going to happen. There's always been this change between, oh, well, in the West, they have tangible goals. In the South, we have a lot of the intangible. We know that this is not true. We've already heard about the Benin bronzes. My colleague knows about Greater Zimbabwe. It is an astounding piece of architecture. It is not taught. Even in West Africa, all I was taught, and I think I'm probably the oldest on the call today, was all about the kingdoms of Benin, which is fine. So I had a fantastic education, but it was purely about West Africa. We need to have an African, in fact, if not a diasporic understanding of the continent. And we also will be able to use that to leverage the ways in which we deal with sustainable development goals. And make no mistake, Heritage is absolutely critical to this discussion. At the moment, we are being told we're going into a Chinese century. Fantastic. Silk Road. We already know that the literal eastern, co eastern seaboard of Tanzania, Can Kenya, they had links with Asia well before the missionaries arrived. These are histories that we need to be able to look at in terms of our heritage. So heritage is both internal or local. I know what happens in my village when I go back to Nigeria, but I also want to know what is happening in Cape Town. I want to know what's happening in Morocco. We need to have this, I would say, AU African approach to how we deal with heritage and how we inculcate this in our youth. We've already talked about decolonization. We now need to look at Africa, in fact, pan-Africanization, I would say. And the sustainable development goals to me are, are methods and ways in which we can begin to re-engage with this culture. We have to change the narrative. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ola. Maybe Dr. Ishan, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, the, the AU instruments and the UNESCO cultural conventions generally complement each other in very, way, in very many ways. 
Uh, but I think the one that particularly stands out for me is the 1972 uh, World Heritage Convention, which is, uh, is, is in itself the embodiment of a recommendation from the 72 Sustainable Development um, Conference uh, in Stockholm. And in itself, it embodies um, uh, approaches to sustainable development uh, in terms of um, the fact that it's, it's the, through the World Heritage System, the World Heritage Sites, for instance, um, the conservation and management of um, those sites could contribute to the reduction of structural um, causes of inequality, such as discrimination and exclusion, because the, um, the basic tenets of sustainable development are applied at, um, those, can be applied at those sites. When we come to the AU Charter of Cultural Renaissance, for instance, it further contextualizes these international conventions from UNESCO, and it lays the rebirth of for Africa anchored in the proud ownership of its past. Until we begin to acknowledge that the person that we think today is from a certain part of the continent, but we do not acknowledge that that person may have come from another part because he was brought there by trade. And I'll give the cola nut trade, for instance. If we, if we were to take the uh, um, take the Kola uh, route in West Africa, we would be surprised by who comes from where. But today, where sometimes we, we, we lose the narrative of, of, focalize, of focusing on, 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 on today rather than how we got to today from yesterday. Um, as the AEU continued to partner with, uh, uh, um, with various uh, development partners, such as the World Bank, um, together there can be uh, you know, um, strategies to address the extreme poverty and to, to boost shared um, prosperity through investment in people. We need to invest in African people. We need to invest in African youth. How do we take that investment? How do we mobilize investment from elsewhere, invest in and deploy our resources around cultural production? around intergenerational exchange. There's something that um, Professor Duku said in her opening, which is about that school learning at the feet of the elders. We are losing a whole generation of people who are in, each one of them is a book. And until we promote that intergenerational ex, um, exchange, we need to move from cultural heritage arts 1.0 to 2.0. But for that to happen, that exchange uh, has to take place and it has to be promoted. And Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishan. Uh, maybe Mrs. Emily Duani, do you want to take this question regarding the contribution yes, of African Union instruments uh, and UNESCO Convention to effectively achieve the sustainable development goals? Um, thank you very much. I think I'd like to talk more about the 2003 Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage um, Safeguarding. And this is because across the continent, most of our cultural heritage is oral, based on oral traditions. And that's why it's even more difficult to preserve, because it's not documented and it's not stored. And if the transmission mechanisms have been interrupted, then there's a high risk that our heritage will die. However, through these conventions, there is a format through which cultural heritage can be preserved. But I think what needs to be done is to identify um, cultural worldviews, cultural logic, cultural philosophies that speak to the conventions rather than the other way around. So that we make sure that communities understand that the conventions are not something that you want to subscribe to, but they are part of what you are preserving because about your heritage and you want to conserve it. Thank you very much, Professor Shedding. On the AU countries. So, sorry, I think that we have some co co connection issue with uh, with you, Mrs. Maybe Professor Shedding? Uh, what I could say is that uh, building on what my colleagues have, um, have said, uh, perhaps I'm going to take a much more critical uh, view and ask the question, you know, what is African about SDGs? What is African about the 1972 convention? Why is Africa underrepresented in terms of world heritage sites? 
So the question then becomes, are we playing a rigged game, right? And, and, for, whose, and, and for whose benefit? So the key thing then in terms of um, interventions, then obviously um, we talk about uh, decolonization of the mind and um, decolonization of practice and the need to have faith in you know, African systems. But how do we translate that into, into practice? How do we uh, translate that into um, a transformed system? So we also need to um, change the way we train. African values need to be embedded in the training uh, from uh, perhaps preschool right up to university. And we also have to have faith in Africans that the Africans can be experts. You know, why do we bring in um, experts from Europe or America on development to teach Africans about development? You know, that is one of those uh, major, major ironies. We need uh, to change to increase awareness. We need to increase capacity building, right? We need to be proud that I am from Zimbabwe. I got my degree from the University of Lagos, right? Not necessarily that, oh, oh I am a graduate of Harvard, you know? So how does that awareness, that transformation? And also, as an African court, we need to ensure that African values must inform global processes. What is the African understanding of sustainability? Then if we were to um, think along these lines and act along these lines, then the um, agenda 2063, the Africa we want, then maybe we can have that. But we can't have it when we are still believing in European systems or in American systems. Thank you very much, Professor. And my last question uh, to all the panelists and maybe uh, all your final uh, remarks, just in one minute, could you tell us what is the main obstacle, just one obstacle, to uh, really integrate into our local, national, regional, and international program the matter of culture and heritage? Maybe Dr. Isha. That's a difficult question, but I think I think in in in, um, in some ways it has been um, aboard, uh, alluded to um, previous as part of our discussion. I think the educational system is not um, fashioned to take into consideration the cultural um, contexts within which that training takes place. And so what you see is that it is perpetrated all along the line. Um, uh, for those who are trained as architects, I trained as an architect in Nigeria, and um, my, my architectural training was not grounded in what was around me. My architectural training was grounded in European um, and uh, other world architectures. But again, um, what else could be an obstacle? Because we perpetuate the educational system, those who are educated also transmit that. So we need a radical shift. And I think we're beginning to see that happen, that rad radical shift in thinking. And it means, what would that take mean that the African academics themselves have to take it upon themselves to document the African heritage, to create the, the, the materials to transmit onto the next generation that is grounded in their own culture, because it is only through the educational system and a radical shift in the educational system that we can see the kind of changing world we, that we hope to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ishan. We need to change our uh, educational system. Professor Shedrick, the main obstacle, and your final was in one minute. We, we cannot hear you, Professor, your mic. The famous phrase, you are muted. <laughs> I think uh, the, the main issue for me is the persistence of um, colonial relations in the, in, in the global world, the persistence of, uh, of inequality. And uh, the fact that uh, um, to my Nigerian colleagues, how many Nigerians visit Ghana as tourists? just to say I'm going to Ghana on holiday, or to say, you know, I am Zimbabwean, uh, let me go to the DRC just um, as a tourist. So the kind of, you know, tourism is meant for the, um, for the European visitor. 
for the American visitor and now for the Chinese visitor, right? So, so, so how do we develop um, these markets so that um, we are proud in our culture and our heritage and that African money must be spent on, on African goods and African things, which include African heritage. If we are able to achieve that a continent of 1.2 billion, that's more than a sizable, you know, uh, market. So we can, we can, we can do it. Thank you. Uh, decolonization and build uh, our market using our culture and heritage. Mrs. Emily Drani, apparently some technical uh, issues. Maybe Professor Ola. Right, I'm ready to come in. Um, I can. Um get back to you immediately. There are lots of Nigerians who now go to Ghana on holidays. But, um, and also I can get back to uh, my colleague from UNIJOS, whom I found out. I actually, my first degrees are from the University of Nigeria. So I'm a true African. And as I said, I've been to Zimbabwe. I've been everywhere apart from Tanzania at the moment. But what I would say is it's actually belief. And it has already been said, Nollywood has been able to create that belief. We look at Nollywood and it is a major industry. After Bollywood, it's the largest industry and you find it in Brazil, you even find it in bits of Cuba. What we have to do, I think in terms of heritage is to actually believe in what we actually understand as our heritage. If we don't have that belief and understanding and this is where the critical thinking comes in, then how do we expect our youth to want to, to have that same kind of heritage? And for me, it's very much the contemporary as well. So I'm the modernist probably on the panel. I mean, I, I certainly agree that there's a historical heritage. I certainly want to see the Benin bronzes back in, in Nigeria. But what I also want to see is that development, our understanding of heritage, which will actually project us into the future. Our problem at the moment architecturally is that we're looking at LA as our example. Before that, it was the colonies. We have to have a belief in what we understand as our culture and how we develop it further. One last example, because I, I know my one minute is over, textiles. The textiles that we have in Africa are all over the world. In fact, this has become such a situation that it's being a culturally appropriated in the West. We have amazing things in, in front of us in Africa, and I'm saying so from the UK, which we simply do not pay attention to. There's that possibility definitely to monetize our heritage and to have it as a business case in itself. But we can't expect those from elsewhere to tell us how to do it. We have to have that belief. Thank you. As Professor Ola, maybe Mrs. Emily, do you want to take it quickly? One minute, please. Okay. Well, we've spoken about is actually a mindset change because if you do not appreciate cultural heritage, you find policymakers will not include it in our vision, national visions. It will not be included in the national development plans. It will not be included in the budget. So there is very little that can be done to make sure that heritage is developed and it's promoted. So that shame or that lack of confidence, the fear of failure, the, the, the failure to invest in heritage is what we have to deal with and not always monetize heritage. Heritage does not always have to be equated to how much money does heritage contribute to the national um, revenue. It's, it's a, a value that cuts across all sectors of development. Thank you. Thank you once again. Unfortunately, time is over and I know that you have much more to say. We'll be continuing this conversation on 26, 27 and 28 of May. Please save the date. Allow me now to conclude our talk by using a quote from, from Nelson Mandela. We can change the world and I'm adding Africa and make it a better place by using the power of our heritage and culture. It is now in our hands to make this difference. Thank you very much. Stay safe and see you soon. Thank you.